Hello, and welcome to Runkle of the Bailey. My name is Ian Runkle. I'm a Canadian criminal defense and firearms lawyer. Today I want to talk about an article that was sent to me by several of you. I think Bianca was first. The headline is, Toronto Police Charge Gun Smuggler in Connection with 2019 Death. I'm going to link the article below. I'm not going to read it to you, but I will sort of hit some of the highlights here. So they note uh, that Toronto Police have charged uh, Jeffrey Gilmore with criminal negligence causing death. And the reason for that is that Mr. Gilmore has already been convicted of firearms trafficking offenses. Uh, I understand he's serving a three and a half year sentence as a result of that. But in the course of investigating him for the firearms trafficking offenses, they identified that a number of these firearms had been purchased apparently in Florida uh, from a gun store. And they've it seems like they've got a list of serial numbers. And so as these guns appear on Toronto streets, they're tracking those serial numbers and connecting it to uh, to this particular individual. So this guy brought in a fair number of guns and they keep sort of drawing more connections and figuring out uh, more of these firearms and what happened to them. Now, what happened to one of these firearms is that it was recovered uh, from a vehicle that was parked on the street. And what police believe happened is that the, uh, the owner of this, and certainly not the lawful owner, but the... Uh, the owner of this particular illegally smuggled handgun, uh, it appears accidentally shot himself and died. Which, uh, just as a pro tip, uh, when you get a firearm legally, they require you to take a safety course, which helps you avoid things like putting a round into your stomach or genitals or leg or other things that you might uh, need or rely on and thus, uh, you know, not dying on the street in public and you know in a very i'm sure that wasn't what he planned for his day so anyway the police now having determined that uh mr gilmore you know the allegation is smuggled this firearm in and that later somebody died with that firearm and as a result of probably mishandling that firearm they're now charging mr gilmore with that uh, death as a criminal negligence causing death now, there's some precedent for it, and the article notes that. Uh, in the past, uh, drug traffickers have been charged with criminal negligence causing death or sometimes even manslaughter uh, with respect to, uh, to drugs that they've sold where people have overdosed and died. Um, there's one case where somebody took a hallucinogen and wandered out into the street and froze to death, and that individual was charged and convicted. But the case law is really mixed as to what it takes to be convicted on that. So some cases have said simply the fact that you're selling the drugs is enough, but that's not the most common. Usually they say, you know, the fact that somebody was selling the drugs and they knew this particular batch was dangerous or they screwed up their dosing somehow or this kind of thing is enough to take it beyond simply selling the drugs but to a point where they take a responsibility for the ultimate user. So, as I said, there's some past precedent for this, but it's going to be interesting to see if the court is willing to apply it uh, to an individual who has smuggled, uh, smuggled firearms. Now, a lot of people are not going to have a whole lot of sympathy for anyone involved in this. Uh, I personally would prefer to see people rehabilitate themselves rather than accidentally shooting and killing themselves, but... Uh, it's, uh, I mean, that's part of the risk of people having illegal firearms is that they, the person they may injure might be themselves, especially if, as mentioned, they don't have proper training. So they note that the officer has been toying with this idea for years, but it took recent advances in tracing and cross-border cooperation to bring the notion into reality. So he, this seems like a pet project for the officers to try to bring one of these charges. I think he's going to have some problems, and I'll get to that. So again, they tracked this to a Florida store where uh, they reported that he'd purchased uh, 42 guns. That's a fair number of firearms to smuggle through. Uh, they caught him. I, I got to say, I'm entirely fine with the police work here, and I think it's great police work that they're tracking a smuggler. And, you know, this is exactly the sort of thing they should be tracking down. Uh there's also some interesting stats here. They note that around five years ago, investigators found that roughly 50% of the smuggled crime guns they could trace were coming from cross-border smuggling. Now note the 
that they could trace. This is a bit of a biased stat, and the reason why is that uh, a lot of firearms they just can't trace. And when you think about firearms that they can't trace, what's one big cause of that they can't trace them? Well, that they came from another country, and especially that they came from another country that might not be cooperative. But as the U.S. has gotten better at sort of sharing information and the like, the share for seized handguns has jumped to around 90%. I don't think that's actually a big change in criminal behavior. I don't think it's that criminals have really adapted or that they're doing things differently. What this number probably means is that we're getting better data sharing and they're able to trace more guns and find out that more of these guns are in fact coming from across the border and particularly across the border from the U.S. Now, I think that they're going to have some big problems here in terms of proof. And the reason why I say that is that uh, with drugs, you typically have a very sort of short chain of, uh, of facts. And what I mean by that is that most people who are buying drugs at the street level are buying them either to consume them themselves or maybe consume them with others. But there's not a lot of like purchase for resale and the drugs are a consumable, you use them up. Whereas a firearm is not a consumable. It's something that, you know, even after you fire it, it persists. This firearm could in turn be traded down many hands. So if we think that, uh, you know, the deceased, who of course the deceased isn't gonna be testifying, the deceased isn't going to be able to say, yeah, that's the guy I bought the gun from. And I doubt that they kept very careful notes, but maybe I'm wrong. I mean, we don't know at this stage what all the evidence is but probably they're not going to get any evidence from the dead guy that's the usual and expected state of things so you know if the dead guy got the gun from the accused here uh, mr gilmore then the police have a pretty good connection you know you can say it's your fault you gave this guy this gun but what if there's an intervening person what if mr gilmore sold it to some other guy and then that other guy sold it to the deceased guy. And we can extend this as far as we want. What if there's 20 people in the way? What if there's 100 people? What if there's 1,000 people? This gun has been passed along, you know, to everyone in Toronto. Let's say everyone in Toronto has passed this gun along to the next person. Are they really going to convict the original smuggler? I don't think so. I don't... I think that they're going to need to show a tight nexus between Mr. Gilmore and the deceased if they're going to get a conviction on this. Uh, there's also scenarios that we can imagine that uh, sort of break the chain of people. Uh, one thing that I think of when I consider that possibility is let's say you've got a guy who, uh, you know, he's got this gun and he ends up leaving it somewhere. You know, he abandons it in a building that he's been staying at and just doesn't return. Or, you know, maybe he leaves it somewhere, it's stashed, and he dies. You know, he gets hit by a truck, he gets killed in an altercation, he, whatever happens. Uh, or he goes into custody, something. And somebody else finds that gun. So there you have an unintended transfer from one person to another. But, you know, there may not be a, a handoff. And again, it might be completely unintentional. The guy is, you know, hanging out, he gets high, the gun falls out of his pocket, somebody else picks it up, something like that. Are we still going to connect the original smuggler? I mean, the original smuggler certainly has a high moral blameworthiness here, and that's what he's being charged with. Um, I actually think the three and a half year sentence, to my mind, seems a little low, but often, uh, often the media kind of misreports sentences as well. So I don't know what the guy's ultimate sentence was. But... You know, he's already been convicted and sentenced on the actual firearms trafficking for that additional level of blame to say that he's connected to the death. I think there's going to have to be something that connects him very closely to this, as opposed to simply you committed the crime. So I'm going to be interested in this case. I'm I'm hoping to see how it you know results. I'm hoping that this ends up being a case that they report on further and that maybe we get a written decision on. I, I'm i a big fan of written decisions because then I don't have to rely on news reports for it. But 
I think that this one might be a bridge too far for the court unless they have that kind of evidence that I think, frankly, is going to be maybe a little unlikely. So that's, uh, I guess, my comments on this one. It's, uh, it's going to be an interesting one, but at this stage, we just don't necessarily know. Thank you for watching. In addition to a link to the article below, I've also got a link to a GoFundMe. And what this is related to is some people who fought uh, Section 74 challenges in Ontario. Uh, they were shut down on jurisdiction questions, but they're looking to challenge that in a higher level of court. And to do that, uh, they really need ABLE counsel. Unfortunately, ABLE counsel is expensive. Uh, they're looking to hire Mr. Burlew, who is fantastic. I can't think of, you know, I can't think of anyone better to uh, to help them out on this. So they are trying to raise funds to make that a possibility. Uh, I've chipped in. If you've got some extra cash, uh, I'd encourage you to do so as well. This is an issue that may end up affecting all of us who are gun owners. And even if you're not a gun owner, I think that this is an issue that uh, should be of concern because really what people are trying to do here is hold the registrar and the Canadian firearms program to following the law. Uh, it's really frustrating when we see people, in my view, not following the legal requirements here. So I've got a link to that below. Again, I encourage you to go check it out. Uh, thank you. I've also got a link to my Patreon below, but if you're thinking right now, hey, which of these two things should I contribute to? Put it towards the GoFundMe. Uh, they, they could use your help right now. Anyway, thank you for watching. I want to thank my Patreon supporters at the $50 level, uh, Demo, Sir Daniel Wicks of Alberta, Canada's National Firearms Association, and Kyle Martin. At the $20 level, Andrew Elsich, Cameron Johnson, Kevin Fleet, and Dale Nesbitt. And at the $10 level, Ma Buddy Keith, Process Eng, Stephen Larson, General Counsel of the CCFR, John Robinson, TR, Roy Haddock, Frackles Dak, John Alexander Tessier, Sir Goat, Sites and Arms Limited, Chava Hollow, Peter H., Craig Kwan, Akin Coxall, North Central Process Service, Toys Are for Boys, Ian Vaughn, Milan Vrekic, Terence Griffiths, Doug Thompson, Mark D., Brad Crooker, Jason Harrington, Lee Kiso, Mark Stout, Michelle Stotzel, Scott Sweetman, Mike Rhodes, DF, Stacey Cartmel, Tactical Advantage TV Canada, Ian S., Dave Leslie, Juan, Stephen Conquest, Darren Duell, Sean Crane, Pete H., Chris Tremblay, Ian Hutchinson, Travis, BC Bushcraft Leather, John Singarty, Misa Komarevich, All Systems Go, David Moga, Ian Hedgedanik, Hello from Canazuela, Taylor Delnea, Rod Guzman, Matthew Nesbitt, Conway Yuri, Toronto Airsoft, James Cox, Zip Ties and Bias Plies, Daniel Kang, Jean Guy Toussaint, Richard, Brock Watts, Frog Clan Copper, Annika Bain, Tim McGill, Jordan Delaney, Rob Butts, Chris Joseph, Grant Farquhar, Malcolm Yogi, Roberto Selbach, Dimaco, Texan Diesel, Prairie Prepper 777, Kevin Fleet, and Soren Rasmussen. Thank you once again for watching, and I hope this has armed you with knowledge.